Because in order to understand why Bob Durst has done the things that he has done, why he's responded the way that he responds, why he says the things that he says, you have to know him. Welcome to Crime News Insider. You're listening to part two of our interview with the Robert Durst prosecution team. Since the recording of this interview, Robert Durst was sentenced to life without parole for the murder of Susan Berman and has been charged in Westchester County with the murder of Kathy Durst. Now let's return to the interview. Let's talk about just the magnitude of this case because the, the death of Susan Berman, that's the murder, but your theory encompasses both the murder or at least the disappearance of Kathy Durst and the murder of Morris Black. You even allege a special circumstance, which makes him eligible for death penalty and life without parole, that Susan Berman was a witness. And Susan Berman, the theory is that when Kathy goes missing, there's a phone call placed to the dean of the medical school that Kathy Durst attended. And the dean says, yes, uh, Kathy called me. Well, how do you know it was Kathy? She said she was Kathy. And we come to find out that Susan Berman was telling other people that she was, the, in fact, the one that made that call at the behest of Robert Durst. So she's a witness. She's helping out Robert Durst. And now your, your case is in, encompassing Kathy Durst from 1982 and then Morris Black of just how, how he, when he's backed in the corner, he, he kills. Eugene, I have a question for you. You said that you kind of organize all of this discovery. How do you go about doing that with the case of this magnitude? Well, I mean, Wait, Eugene's not allowed to talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think fine. What made it easier was because it's three distinct cases, we've got all the, the discovery from the Westchester County DA's office regarding uh, Kathy's disappearance. Mm -hmm. So that came up in uh, 27 boxes that were sent over to us. And so we organized that. And then there was another 17 boxes that came out of Galveston. We actually, all of us went to Galveston early on in the case to, to meet with the prosecutors in, in Galveston to go over the materials that they had. So we were there for about a week um, with a couple investigators to go through all the materials, make sure that, that uh, we have a copy of everything that was in their possession. So we covered those two cases um, with those agencies. And then we have obviously uh, LAPD's robbery homicide division that put together their own discovery. And they, they kind of split their discovery up into a 2000 investigation. So the investigation that took place shortly after Susan Berman was actually murdered, Mm -hmm. And then after the case went cold, then they reopened in 2012. So we had a 2012 set of discovery as well. So, so it actually, if you, if you look at that, it's kind of like four separate, you know, areas of discovery. Exactly. So it made it easier to organize, organize it that way. Slightly easier though. Yeah. You make, you yeah, make yeah, it sound so easier. easy. <laughs> how many, how many pages of discovery? I think there was over almost 190,000, if I'm not mistaken. Eugene is under, he's underselling what he did because he getting the discovery and organizing is one thing, you know, creating it into a searchable PDF is one thing, but you know, as you know, a lot of police reports that are handwritten are not searchable and notes aren't searchable, et cetera. So he had a massive spreadsheet going, which cross reference subject matter by bait stamp range, et cetera. So you could go into a, Excel spreadsheet, word search that, and then find some handwritten notes somewhere within the discovery. So it, he did a fantastic job. That's really smart. Wow. And, and did he share that spreadsheet with the defense? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they would have wanted to see it. They would, they would freak, frequently at the beginning of the case, throughout the case, they would get up and they would say, we weren't given, this is an abomination. We were never given this discovery. And Eugene would stand up actually January 5th, 2017 <laughs> at Bates stamp, blah, blah, blah. They would literally, this happened about 10 times. And then all of a sudden they stopped saying it. They, they, they stopped saying it. Yeah. We really, like we said, we invested a lot of time on the front end on getting all this stuff in order because we knew it was going to be a trial from the start. 
And so we knew that we really needed to make sure that we were in a position to be able to quickly find what we needed. When you guys starting, so starting the trial and how long did motions take days? Like how, how many days did you talk about motions? I mean, we, well, no, we litigated, we litigated probably more than a hundred complex thousands of pages of, I mean, we have motions that were four or 500 pages long wow. w- with exhibits. And then we would have oppositions and responses and replies. So we started litigating motions almost instantly and we litigated everything under the sun. I mean, if you, and most things repeatedly. And did you do that purposefully just so that you could foreclose issues popping up? Yeah. So, so, so we had a plan from the start pretty much of what we wanted to do. And that involved, okay, we we're going to bring in this evidence and we wanted to make sure that we litigated this evidence as early as possible. So one of the things that we needed to do was we wanted to litigate the admissibility of the statement in New Orleans. The defense was going on TV and they were saying that, you know, we had committed misconduct by interviewing Durst in New Orleans when we had done it, when he was represented. That wasn't the state of law at all. And so that was, again, one of the issues where we started filing motions and we pushed to have all that stuff litigated. So there were there were four big, big issues in the case. The first issue was bringing in the situation with Kathy by charging the special circumstance of witness killing uh, that automatically meant to prove the witness killing. We had to litigate all the stuff about Kathy Durr. So instead of having to do an 1101 B motion where we are bringing in, we're saying we want to bring in the issue with Kathy Durst. We special circ the witness killing so that they would have to sever it. And there's no way they can do it. Um, and, and just so our audience knows, some of them may not be lawyers. 1101B motion, 1101B is in the evidence code that basically says you can't bring in, you know, prior bad acts necessarily of, uh, of a defendant or a, a witness, certainly, unless it's there to prove something else that's admissible. Like this is his MO, this is his scheme or intent or knowledge. So that's what 1101B is motion. And it's very difficult to get it in that way, it seems. Um, a lot of judges are hesitant, but when you file a special circumstance, this person was a witness. Now you have to prove that that underlying murder. Right. So, so, so we did that. And then, then as a part of that, once you're bringing in Kathy, then she's in essence, a murder victim. Right. So once she's a murder victim, now you have to prove the motive for that murder and you're allowed to bring in the prior violence on Kathy. But so we were able to, to, uh, bring in the issue of the domestic violence involving Kathy. The second big issue was going to be the murder of Morris Black and the dismemberment. Yeah. How'd you get that into evidence? Well, I mean, everything starts with Kathy. All right. And since everything starts with Kathy and since the whole reason Durst was in Galveston and the whole reason that he is saying he cut up Morris Black's body had to do with the issues of Morris Black. I'm sorry, Kathy. We were able to make a very compelling argument to the judge that, in essence, Morris Black was part of a common plan or scheme that has to do with covering up his murder of Kathy. So Kathy was the beginning of everything that led to Susan, which led to Morris. There were also numerous issues regarding the way that Morris Black, his body was disposed of, where there were circumstantial evidence that he had done the same thing to Kathy. So we litigated that. It was litigated uh, very, very, very thoroughly. The defense tried to writ it. Their writ was denied. They relitigated it probably five times. So we won that. The third big issue was the forfeiture by wrongdoing. And this is an example of um, I'm kind of an evidence code nut. So the evidence code, you know, is something that I try to make sure that I know very, very well. And so we had a law clerk at the time who suggests to Habib, and I will never forget this. Um, what about forfeiture by wrongdoing? And um, I had never thought of it. And the reason I'd never thought of it, even never I thought of it. Because we don't use it very we often. We never use it. We <laughs> yeah. never use it. And so, you know, just by coincidence, he, he thinks of it and like, oh, my God, 
you know, I had never used it in a case because obviously you can only use it where the person is killed to prevent them from becoming a witness. Those are generally only going to be in, in gang cases. My experience is not as a gang homicide prosecutor. It's as a circumstantial uh, evidence homicide prosecutor. And so, but for the law clerk suggesting it, I think we would have eventually probably get, uh, have gotten there, but uh, that's not where we were thinking. So we filed that motion. Those were the big motions in the case and we won them all. And so once those issues were decided, I think the defense really had their work cut out for them. Can we can we talk a little bit about some of the, the challenges of a trial like this? One, your you know, your defendant is like, I think, 78 years old and has a lot of issues or made up issues or just general medical issues. And then you had COVID on top of that. How did your team deal with all of those issues? It was thought by kind of the prevailing wisdom was, oh, Bob's an old guy and the jury's going to feel sorry for him. So we elected to one of the things that we wanted to do. And this, this is why when you're going to try media cases, you can't listen to what people are going to say. The, the so-called experts, they haven't tried cases like this. Most of them, quite honestly, don't know their head from their ass. So they're going to be up there saying what they're going to say. And we knew from the start what our case was going to look like. It was going to look like we were going to, first of all, introduce the jury to Bob Durst. Who is Bob Durst? Because in order to understand why Bob Durst has done the things that he has done, why he's responded the way he responds, why he says the things that he says, you have to know him. And so that's where we started. That's where the case started. So a lot of things about who Bob Durst was, that then, you know, goes to, how Bob and Kathy got involved. And we were very confident that over time, when the jury understood who Bob Durst was, it wasn't going to matter whether he was, you know, 78 years old, whether he was in the stretcher, it would not matter. They would not like who he was for proper reasons, nothing improper about it. They would understand that he was a domestic violence abuser. They would understand why he killed uh, Kathy. They would understand how Susan got involved. So. The, those logistics were not problematic. The COVID thing was a nightmare. And our big concern was that we were going to have to start over. And we were very, very satisfied with how the trial had gone. The defense started asking for mistrials during jury selection. They did not like how things were going. They wanted a do-over. Durst wanted a do-over. So that was very stressful for all of us. Yeah, that's got to be very, uh, very stressful thinking that the judge could declare a mistrial at any stage. And I just listening to some of the clips, I mean, the defense is asking for mistrial left and right. One of which is because, oh, he's too sick to to go through with this. He can't testify. He has, I mean, it came out like dementia. And um, at one point he had a catheter. I got to ask you about this. Raise your hand if you're a prosecutor and emptied someone, a defendant's catheter for him <laughs> in court. I see no hands raised except for maybe yeah, John. Yeah, no, 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 that, so that was a, one of the issues that I was concerned with was uh, Bob had significant health issues. He's 78 years old. Our position was not that he didn't have significant health issues. Sure. Our, our issue was, first of all, he's not going to get any better. If you look at actuarially, he's going to get worse. And we're not, he doesn't get a free ride because he was old enough and managed to murder enough people uh, that, you know, you don't get, well, I'm 80 now. So yeah, you can't prosecute me for the murders I've committed. So when he ended up having his catheter bag full and I let the defense attorneys know that it was full, um, you know, their response was, well, we're not going to do anything. And my concern was he was already having bladder issues. I didn't want him having an infection. You know, it's not a big deal. You just open the valve and you drain it. So that that's what we did. I, you know, I was not um, I was not performing surgery. I just opened the bag at the toilet. It was very strange. I can tell you the look that Bob had when myself and the bailiff went back there <laughs> and he sees me. I want I didn't say it, but the joke I was going to make was, you know, you told me that uh, we were going to talk when you came back from court. On March 15, 2015. Now we can finish. But um, <laughs> so, so I asked him, you know, do you want me to, I'm just here to help you. Do you want me to change it? Go ahead. So that's what I did. <laughs> so I, so I drained it and that was, that was it. And the defense had no objection clearly. And you put on the record, like, I, I just want to put that on record. I went there, I changed it. 
it was all good. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, l- l- listen, the, um, yeah, I think it was, I wanted to make sure that there were no allegations and, um, you know, the problem was I asked them to do it and they didn't seem to have an interest. So it needed to be done. Yeah. And so, you know, we wanted to make sure this trial got finished. Well, that's one way to do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's one well, way you know, we it. try to be full service here. <laughs> you <laughs> really were. You, you, you handled everything. We do what we can. So you also had numerous jail calls talking about how he was just faking dementia and maybe this Asperger's syndrome he tried to, tried to use. And uh, I just want to go to Ethan. It seemed like John was ready and had it at his fingertips anytime Robert Durst was testifying under cross-examination and said something different or denied something that John asked him, like you said X, didn't you? No. And then he had it at his fingertips. Ethan, how'd you go about doing that and having that ready for, for John? Basically we had everything that Durst had ever said transcribed, uh, go through the transcripts, highlight what we wanted. We thought was important that would be relevant that he'd either lie about or that we thought would be important to bring up. Each one of those transcripts gets highlighted. And and then what I have is uh, I attribute a code to each quote, each clip that we're going to use. That clip then, or that code is then put into Excel, Microsoft Excel, and then compiled with the actual quote, the, uh, the date, the transcript, page numbers, and then the time code for when it was cut. For the majority of it, for the professional stuff, it was almost exclusively in Avid, uh, which is basically what every major film studio is using to cut their or edit their their films. You go and see 007, it was probably edited on Avid. So we had a license to Avid, import everything into there, and then uh, export everything as a code number so that basically Lewin could go through his outline and be like, this is the thing, this place. So he's got an outline as he's approaching uh, cross-examination with Durst and he's hitting areas. And we know ahead of time that he's going to hit this particular area. And we have that that quote coded so that if uh, Durst says something inconsistent, he just uh, says, okay, then play this internal code number and then we'll pull it up. The most important thing is having a system of organization. So they we're on the same page and we know exactly what we're going to put. I mean, if you have 800 clips of Robert Durst, uh, it's basically worthless if you can't pull up what you need when you want it. Sorry, that was a long answer. I'll give you, I'll give you the TikTok answer. So Ethan did a fantastic job of uh, categorizing each clip that John potentially wanted to use it and assigning a code number. And John could then put those in his outline. And when he wanted to impeach him with something, he could just pull up the code, ask Ethan to play it. And Ethan had it at his fingertips. And some of it was even, or it seemed just listening to it on replay, it would be of something Durst testified to just, you know, a couple days ago. Would you like just stay up all night and and yeah, so organize basically that? every night the trial was broadcast on YouTube. I would basically pull a clip from YouTube or pull the day's uh, recordings from YouTube, import it into Avid, and then add to my spreadsheet on uh, Dirt. So I'd see like, uh, okay, I think this is an important section. Uh, I would take copious notes during the cross examination whenever Durst was testifying and uh, highlight the or note roughly what I thought would be important. Then when we got to that night, I would go home, just uh, start pulling the clips and then adding to the spreadsheet, giving them new numbers, uh, and then getting them to Lewin so that he'd be ready to uh, incorporate them into his uh, uh, cross-examination uh, plan. One of my favorite points in the uh, it, with regard to that was there was a point when there was a objection, Lewin went to sidebar and the judge was like, hey, how are you going to impeach uh, Durst on these these statements? Because the judge in his mind was thinking uh, in a traditional trial, you you need to impeach him with transcripts. And uh, he's, you know, we don't have transcripts. We don't have dailies on this. And Lewin was like, yeah, uh, we got video clips. So I, I thought that was pretty cool. And the other cool part about this whole process was the, the at its best, I could turn around something at you know, after a session. So for example, Tim noticed something that uh, Durst said in the, uh, um, I think it was that I can't, do you remember, do you guys remember what? Buried, buried, no, buried no, the body. Yeah, buried the body. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. So he said, uh, 
Dur said, like, I buried the body. So then at our next break, I just pulled that clip and then we could play it immediately. But I mean, the, the, it's really like, it's the future of prosecution. Like at some point you're going to have lots of media, lots of uh, uh, video, and you're going to have to be able to marshal that evidence and be able to pull it up on a dime. Guys are the dream team. Yeah. One of the things that, that I think is, is important to note is that although you saw Habib and I doing most of the stuff in court, everybody was working extremely hard all the time. So as an example, you know, when I'm doing, doing the, the cross-examination plan took me a year of time going through it, but I'm not able when I'm questioning him, I've got to think of where I'm going. What's my plan? What's the next move? What clips do I do? I not want to use. And there's no way that I'm going to be able to pick up every single thing that's said. And so when you have four other lawyers that are watching everything going on, nothing got past it. They would see something. Tim might see it. Ethan would be texted or they would pull the clips and we would be ready. So we're not ignorant to go. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, this is how it should be for every prosecutor. Well, unless you have a team of lawyers and the resource devoted to do it, you know, this is not what somebody who's carrying 25 trials and going to to trial by themselves can do. So we're not ignorant to the fact that we were kind of operating in a whole different kind of situation than, than most line prosecutors, even, you know, special unit prosecutors find themselves in. All right. I have a question. How did you and Habib decide who was going to open and who was going to close? Because that, that seems like something you'd have to arm wrestle for. Well, I, I mean, how do we decide it? So, um, all of us are, are very close. We're close professionally. We're close personally. Because it was my case from the start, and I'm, and I'm also the most senior person by time in the office and age on the team, I, I was in the end. And also Wade. <laughs> Wade, I'm also the heaviest. This is true. Um, and, and I have maybe the most hair, Ooh, um, which is amazing true, given, the, given the fact that I'm, I'm the oldest and the Yes, I'm, I'm the heaviest. I don't know if you guys found it distracting, but Ethan's bald head would sometimes reflect in the, in the shot. I found it Gotta difficult. Call makeup. At time, it was hard. I mean, I almost wanted to go, can we do something about the bald guy? Um, it was really, uh, I'm trying to do cross-examination here. It was very hard. I thought of Habib's comment about the, uh, the, her, um, the picture of Ethan before and after. Oh, that was, it was awesome. pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. So, okay. So to answer your question, here's what happened. The opening was because it required a very long narrative and a lot of knowledge about the case. I don't think, um, I mean, Habib could have done it, but I was in a much better position to do it. Closing, what we decided was that because the, a lot of the, the witnesses, particularly at the end, and some of the more difficult witnesses were my witnesses, Habib and Ethan were able to work on Habib and its closing and Ethan's closing throughout the trial. So the plan was always for them to do the closing. I like on every case where I have another lawyer that works with me, I always do rebuttal um, because my view is it's the last time and you cannot pre-plan rebuttal. So that's how we worked it out. And then we wanted the other lawyers to be able to participate. Ethan had done some of the technical stuff involving the reconstruction in Galveston. And so he did that part of the closing uh, and that was it. That's how we kind of arrived at it. Um, let's, let's talk about some other aspects of, of the trial uh, or the cadaver note. You know, there was motions to, I think, exclude it or suppress it. And you guys won that motion. And then a couple weeks before trial is what, it, from what I understand, they stipulate that Robert Durst wrote this cadaver note. And even though they stipulated to it, you guys still went into it um, heavily because I mean, that is, that is probably one of the most damning pieces of evidence. Do you think that if the cadaver note was never written, if Robert Durst never sent that note to the police, do you think you still would have won this case? Well, I mean, Jorge, if, if he wouldn't have written the cadaver note, then he wouldn't have been able to have been impeached by Jarecki 
we wouldn't have been able to get the admissions we got from him. I mean, it's real simple. Forget about whether we would have been able to win the case. Um, we wouldn't have been able to prosecute the case. Him writing the cadaver note ensured that we had a shot. So no, that was crucial, necessary. Couldn't have done it without it. Does, does, does anybody disagree? No, I don't. I, I mean, that, so that one piece of evidence is really the linchpin uh, for your case. Well, it's the it's it's extremely important because it's the it's not that in and of itself. It's certainly a huge issue, but it opened the door for everything else. Without that, we don't have any of the other things that we have. So. That's amazing. You rarely get that in, in a case where the case can just turn to I can't prosecute it to I got this guy beyond a reasonable doubt and I, I could I could build a case. That's amazing. All right. So let's um, let me go to Durst's testimony if I can. So on on. Cross-examination, I mean, obviously, maybe people don't know this, but a lot of times we don't know what the defendant's going to testify to. Yeah, you interviewed him. He he gave prior statements, and, and you could prepare for all of that. But to backtrack and cover some of all these other th issues that he has to cover, we don't necessarily know what he's going to say. Like, for example, he tried to claim when he was talking to himself on the, on the jinx and the hot mic, where he says, there it is, you're caught. Oh, you're caught writing the cadaver note, which is what I'm admitting to right now. When I said, kill them all, I really said, they'll think I killed them all. Did you know any of the stuff that he was going to say? Was there anything that really surprised you when he got up there and testified? Well, first of all, I didn't care what he was going to say. Right. I already knew the whole point was I was going to cover his life A to Z on cross. So whatever he was going to say on direct, here's what I knew. He was going to have to say he wrote the cadaver note. He was going to have to say he found the body. And, and anything else that he said was going to be inconsistent. He was going to have to admit that he had repeatedly committed perjury. So there was zero concern with, oh, my God, Bob can say X, Y, Z. Now, that being said, he absolutely shocked us. So, for instance, when he admitted that he had committed perjury five times during this very trial. At least five so, times. And yeah, so certain things, five times. Yeah, so certain things you could not prepare yourself yeah, for. Yeah, that was beautiful. Um, or, or when he says that um, he felt um, uh, her cold breath. Yes. And, and, I, and I don't know if you guys saw the clip. My response was literally, wait. She's dead. You know, <laughs> she's a stiff. She can't breathe. You know, I mean, so he would say stuff where where it was just shocking. None of us have ever seen so much perjury in such a short period of time on so many issues. We'll never see it again. I mean, I think you're, and he's such such an admitted perjurer yes. too. You don't really get that very often. I mean, the level a of shameless, narcissism and a shameless, shame, a totally shameless, shameless perjurer. I mean, he will. So there, there was a point where where, and Ethan did great work and Habib in this issue regarding the reconstruction. So we were able to show that the whole the Galveston defense was bullshit, and that he had murdered Morris, and and we did it by taking apart his statements about what happened versus testimony about what happened versus the physical evidence and even his defense attorney's recon defense experts reconstruction. But the part that amazed me was, I don't know if you guys saw this, we're showing him the animation video and the animation video shows him grabbing the gun from underneath. But his testimony is I grabbed it from on top. So we have it frozen where his hand is underneath it. And I'm saying to him, uh, Bob, where is your hand? It's on top of the gun. Wait, look at the animation video. It's on top of the gun. So he's literally looking at it, looking at the sky and going, yeah, the, the sky is not blue. It's black. You're like, but it's blue. So he would not just lie about illogical things. You know, you could put up a picture of a dog and he would say it was a donkey. And what do you even, where do you go? At times I would just go, okay. Uh, I'll move on to the next area. So, yeah, no, that was crazy. But there was nothing that he said that we were worried about on his testimony whatsoever. What was crazy to listen to about that Galveston uh, recreation, for some reason, 
the defense attorneys were recreating it in court. Now, I don't know if you know of a, this LA case from a long time ago where you have uh, people recreating stuff and it goes horribly south. Yeah, well, well, so, so let me, let, let me, let me tell you how that came about. <laughs> this is so, like your suggestion, right? It was at my, so Bob is up there and he can't, and Dick wants to basically do a, kind of a recreation with Bob, like they did in Galveston. This is Dick DeGuerin, the defense yes. attorney for yeah. Bob. Yes, correct. And so the, the judge says that Bob can't stand up and Bob says, Oh no, I can stand up. <laughs> and then the judge basically in his, in his, in his very subtle way is like, well, no, um, the bailiff says you can't stand up. And the judge says, he's the boss. And he asked the bailiff, the bailiff says no. So Bob can't really reenact it. So I say to, to uh, Dick and Dave, to Chesnoff and to Garen, you know, why don't one of you do, if you're going to do this, it doesn't make sense. Why don't one of you play Bob and one of you play <laughs> Dick? And uh, yeah, they did it. You're, you're just mean now. <laughs> uh, uh, and they did it. If I can add on to that one thing is while they were doing it, Lewin was so enraptured with how stupid the thing looked that he was actually standing and and blocking the camera. And I was thinking to myself, I need this clip. So I pulled yes. Lewin out of the way of the camera. And then one of Habib's uh, favorite parts is uh, at the end of everything, after they said everything, and they're like, and that's how it happened. And, and I said, and they're basically a foot away from the chair, which would have been impossible because they had to, through the recreation that they wanted, to get all the way through the kitchen. Uh, I mean, the whole thing was ridiculous. We, 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 we had a much better understanding of the legal and factual issues of the case than the other side. It seemed that way. Uh, hey, I, I'm mindful of the time, so I, I just want to get to a couple quick questions before um, we get to the quiz. Number one, the jury is out. I mean, this, this trial lasted months, right? Five months yes. or so. The yes. jury was out for seven and a half hours. OJ's jury was out for four hours before returning a not guilty verdict. Were you feeling nervous at all when you learned that the jury reached this quick verdict? Absolutely not. There was, there was one possibility on this case that would have been bad. Only one. There was a small possibility that we would have had one or two jurors that were going to hang the case. As soon as which is every case, right? Which is every case correct. where every prosecutor's fear, right? Correct. Is there's gonna be one hanger, one or two correct. kind of outliers, yep. even on a solid slam dunk, which your case was, but any solid slam yes. dunk case, that's always the fear. That there wasn't unless we had a juror who was out of it or corrupt, um, just didn't get it, it was gonna be a conviction. So once we knew there was a conviction. And I knew as soon as I was conviction, I knew that they had convicted him on everything because we would have been told that, well, we've reached a verdict on X, but we haven't reached a verdict on the special circ. And we knew we had an incredible jury and we knew that once we had. So, no, there was no nervousness at all. We were we were very we were very uh, confident uh, at that situation. One, one other question. Cold, cold cases are kind of unique because. Victims' families sometimes are have passed or or you know aren't around. But what was it like uh, delivering news or having family members and friends, both Susan and Kathy, around to hear what had happened so many years later? Well, I, it was a unique situation because because it was broadcast. There was no delivering anything. Everybody knew, but you know right. we certainly um, you know were mindful of the fact that you know Susan really did not have uh, many people left. And so, um, you know, it, it, it different than it, than it's been in other cold cases I've done. We, you didn't have that situation of kind of delivering the news. We, we gotta, we gotta ask this question of John, maybe of his team about John Lewin. If there was a, if there was a Netflix movie made about <laughs> yes. the trial, who would play John Lewin? Jonah Hill. Well, John Kennedy's already dead. Jonah Hill. Hold on a second, hold on a second. <laughs> Ethan, what was your answer? Jonah Hill. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I'm so sick of that. I'll tell you who I get. It's really demoralizing. And this goes way back. 25 years ago, a person in my office told me, you know, who you remind me of. And it wasn't even this probably before your time. 
she wanted to say John Lovitz. But instead of saying John Lovitz, she said, I reminded her of the animated version of John Lovitz in The Critic. Critic. Yes. Uh, I I mean, that's not (laughs) who you're looking for. Um, The other, here's who I get all the time. I'm told that I look like Jonah Hill or Mall Cop. I I personally think that, I don't know about you guys, I think maybe Channing Tatum. (laughs) if bob can get ryan gosling i'm holding out for channing tatum humble john lewis i would say uh bob odenkirk oh and not because of the better call saw thing but i i can i could see him uh playing you but uh <laughs> that's good um thank you so much team you, you spent i mean we're really grateful for no you problem, talking guys. to us as Prosecutors to prosecutors, you did an amazing job. We're so proud of you. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I, th- thank th- you. Th- th- there is one thing that I think is important. I think I speak for, for all of us on this. It was really important to me. Prosecutors, and especially our office, we have just been taken apart in the media over the years for high profile cases. And it was really important to us that we put on as good a case as we could. And that in the end, no one was going to be able to say, oh, the LADA's office is a joke. They don't know what they're doing. It was really important to us. And so, uh, you know, we were given the resources that we needed and the support that we needed. And, um, you know, I think when prosecutors get the time and the and the opportunity, and the resources to do good work, you know, we'll do good work. Yeah, absolutely. Outstanding. Well, before we end the show, do you have a few moments to play our quiz? <laughs> sure, we, sure. We have a quiz. Uh, so each week we look at the laws on the books. Three are real. One is fake. And it's your job to guess which one is the fake. There's a theme in this quiz, and it has to do with Robert Durst and his many states of where he's committed crimes. These are California laws? Nope. These are laws throughout the country. Oh, that makes it a little trickier. Okay. Okay. So pay attention. So three are real. One is fake. Okay, so A, in New York, it is illegal to commit adultery. B, in Galveston, Texas, it's illegal to bury a body except in a cemetery. C, in Beverly Hills, it's illegal for a person to discover a body or acquire the first knowledge of the death of a person and fail to report it. D, in Louisiana, it's illegal to wear a facial disguise calculated to conceal your identity, except during specified activities like Halloween, Mardi Gras, et cetera. All right. So, sorry, three are real, one is fake. And why don't we start with uh, Habib? Which one do you think is the fake? C. C, Beverly Hills. It's illegal for someone to discover body and acquire first knowledge. All right. You're, you're, you're an LA prosecutor. Maybe you know uh, Beverly Hills law. Uh, John, what do you think? So we're saying three are real, one is fake. Yeah. So New York, it's adultery. Galveston, Texas, specifically illegal to bury body except the cemetery. Beverly Hills, you have to call the authorities uh, to report a dead body. In Louisiana, it's illegal to wear facial disguise to conceal your identity. I just can't think it can be a law on the books, even currently, even if unenforced, that adultery is illegal. I'm going to go with A. Okay. And uh, obviously, Robert Durst was uh, having an affair, so that's why... That's in that theme. Uh, Eugene, what do you think? I'm going to go with Habib and, and say C as well. C as well. All right. Rob? I'm going to go with uh, Habib, also C. C. All right. And Ethan? All right. A. 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 Usually, by the way, generally speaking, when we would have disagreements in this case, it was always four against one or five against one. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so this is... Uh, I have some support from Ethan. All right. And Lori? You know, I'm going to, I'm going to go with a also New York. Hey, okay. So that means you all agree that in Louisiana, it's illegal to wear a facial disguise calculated to conceal your identity, except during activities like Mardi Gras and Halloween, et cetera. And as you know, Bob Durst was found with this flesh tone mask that could disguise him. John, wisely did not ask him to wear the mask uh, in court. That, that could go bad. <laughs> and you all think this one is real. And this one is on the books. Louisiana revised statute section, uh, title 14, section 313, wearing a masks or facial disguises in public places is prohibited except for Mardi Gras, religious events, et cetera. So good job there. Let's go to B in Galveston, Texas. It's illegal to bury a body except in a cemetery. 
you all think this one is on the books and this one is on the books. Section 11-1 in Galveston, Texas says, it shall be unlawful for any dead body to be buried or any person to so bury a dead body within the city, except in a private or public cemetery. So there's, that should have been another charge against Robert Durst. <laughs> in, in <Galveston. laughs> okay. And let's go with a, in New York, it's illegal to commit adultery. Uh-huh. Lori and uh, Habib. No, I'm sorry. Lori and no, John. John and Ethan. And Ethan. And Ethan. I'm Lori, switching John and Ethan. to me now, given your order. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Lori, I know. I know. Lori, Lori John and us. Ethan think this is real. Or, I'm sorry. You guys think it's fake. And this one is real. It's penal code section 255.17. A person is guilty of adultery when he engages in sexual intercourse with another person at a time when he has a living spouse or the other person has a living spouse. Class B misdemeanor. That all means in C, that is the fake. It is not on the books for Beverly Hills, but I did find a section in Hudson, Ohio, that basically says no person who discovers the body or acquires first knowledge of the death shall fail to report the death immediately. So good job, everyone. Good work. Right, right. Good job. Thank you. Uh, thank you for playing the game. Thank you for coming on Crime News Insider and what a tremendous job. And thank you for your service to the public and your dedication to public safety. Really appreciate it. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. Thank Take you. Care. Take care. Okay. Take care. All right. Bye. And until next time, we'll see you on the Crime News Insider Podcast. expressed on this podcast are solely of the speakers and do not reflect the views of the Deputy DA's Association nor the District Attorney. Questions and comments can be submitted through our website at sddaa.net. Remember to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at San Diego DDAs. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next week.